Greetings! I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this M10 Achilles tank destroyer. As you can see, this is a Tamiya 148th scale kit. There's nothing on the back of the box, as usual, but pretty much everything you need to know, along with cool art, is on the front of the box. See? Right there. Inside the box we find a bunch of stuff all wrapped in plastic. There are a handful of sprues, including two with the wheels, tracks and bogies. The other four hold the rest of the bits that you will find helpful in your quest to build an M10. The parts here are very nice and neat. I mean, it is a Tamiya kit, and as silly as it is to let your expectations get out of hand, it is reasonably safe to expect a pretty high quality from Tamiya's kits. The plastic is nicely moulded and very neat looking. That's not to say there are no mould lines, quite the contrary, but they are quite minor and shouldn't take a lot of time or effort to clean up, and that's something I think a lot of people can appreciate. The detail is quite good. You can see on the hull for example, there's some very nice weld detail. It's a little bit subtle, but it is there and I think it looks quite good. Of course all of the other bits look good too. I'm no expert, nor am I a rivet counter, so I can't tell you if the detail is 100% realistic, nor do I especially care if some almost unnoticeable bolt is 2mm out of place. What matters to me is there's a good amount of convincing detail that should build up into a very nice model, and you are not going to have to sell any organs to buy it. To me a 148th scale kits are pretty reasonably priced after all. I'm fairly sure this final sprue with the tools and guns on it is common across a lot of US vehicles. It's the same one that came on my Pershing, and I would wager that if I bought a Sherman, or even a Hellcat, I'd find the same sprue there too. Not that that's a bad thing at all. In addition to the plastic we get a decal sheet. There's not a huge number of markings here, and we can only name the tank Chelsea, but that's fine, and they'll work well. In fact this is kind of common for Tamiya vehicles. They only usually offer one or two different markings. I guess I'm used to wargaming kits where there's a ton of different decal options. Oh well, it's not bad, just different. And if you really wanted different markings for this model, I would imagine aftermarket decals are very easy to find, and a lot of modellers, like myself, probably already have plenty of leftover decals from other projects. And if you're really keen you can always hand paint markings. It's a lot of waffling about decals and markings. In addition to those we get these weights. It seems most of Tamiya's kits in this scale include some sort of extra weight, quite often in the form of a die cast hull. In this case, cylindrical weights. The weights in the Churchill were different still. I don't feel like the weights are necessary, though I do add them anyway because why not? And of course we get instructions. These are about the same as the previous Tamiya kits that I've built, so if you've seen those videos, which I hope you have, this shouldn't be anything new. They are the kind that fold out horizontally, which I'm not the biggest fan of. I much prefer a booklet, but they are usable and I was easily able to follow them and get the model built. The last page has a basic painting guide, which is in black and white, which is fine, though in my opinion it's a bit more useful as a marking guide than a painting guide. That's not all we get though, we also get polycaps. Eight of them. Eight! Not all eight of them are going to be used, so I guess we're going to have spares. I'm not sure how clear it is, but these are two sets of different sizes. Enough of that, let's get to the building. I start with the bogies, which is where we'll be putting these little wheelie boys. This assembly is fairly simple, though do make sure that you're paying attention to the instructions for the correct parts. The wheels should have the front with the… what would you call it? The spoky bits? The detail facing outwards. The more open end should face inward. Then the middle part with the return roller and skid goes on. You want to make sure that you position this part the correct way around. Refer to the instructions just to be sure. The inner frame part goes on next, and with a bit of pressure goes into place nicely holding the wheels within. You could leave these to roll freely if you wanted, but there's not really much point so I glued them. The leading bogies for each side have a pin on the return roller. This will help with the tracks later on. When viewed side by side they should face different ways. This is obviously so that they're facing the same way with the return roller towards the front when they're glued onto their respective sides of the tank. Once all six bogies are assembled, I move on to the hull rear. I glue on this, I guess it's the idler wheel mount? 
probably has a better name, but whatever it is it's easy enough to glue into place like so. Then for whatever reason I installed the muffler and exhaust part next. Maybe I thought it would be easier to install without the other idle amount. Who knows? Doesn't really matter does it? I glue the other idle amount into place next. I'm pretty sure the sequence of operations here is not important. Next comes this bracket. This is where the towing hook will mount. And since we've got that in place, why not get all crazy and install said towing hook? Madness, right? Then I install this, as usual I'm not sure of a better term, so I'm just going to call it a plate. I'm not sure what it does of course, but it looks like it has something to do with intake air, though I'm not sure why you would want the exhaust poking through if that was the case. I could be totally wrong, but what I'm right about is that this part is very easy to install. I put that aside, and then installed a poly cap into the inner drive sprocket part. Then why not attach the outer part? This is keyed so that it goes on properly, but if you want to be sure that it's gone together with the teeth aligned right, you can always check by rolling it along the tracks. Next I take the hull bottom part, put maybe too much super glue in, and then drop the weights into place. There's a bit of play here, but that's fine. This isn't something that needs precise balance, so as long as they're inside the little indentations they should be fine. Obviously these weights are some sort of metal, which rudely refuses to be bonded by plastic cement, so super glue is needed for this. Also, as I said earlier, these weights are not required, and you could leave them off. The choice is yours. Then I install the inner hull floor part. This simply mounts into some round guides at either end of the weights. If the weights happen to debond, this should stop them from falling out, but it won't stop them from rattling around and will make it very hard to glue them back into place. So let's just hope that doesn't happen. I don't see why it would. Anyway, the part is easy to get into place. Moving on, I attach the whole side parts. Assembly is easy and there's keying to make sure of that. A little pressure does help of course, but other than that there isn't a whole lot to it. Next come these little supporty pole things. There's obvious points on the whole floor where these should go. They're not just for decoration, they'll support the upper hull later on. Final drive casings come next. Yet another straightforward and simple part to install. Just make sure to get the guide pins in their holes and you're golden. Not literally golden though, if that were the case you would die. Then I glue the rear plate assembly to the rear of the hull. The shape of these parts makes it quite easy to get into place correctly, though of course our friend Pressure did have to make an appearance. Then, because an engine is a private thing and you don't want any Tom, Dick or Harry to be looking at it, I install this wall part into the rear of the crew compartment. This will nicely hide the engine. Don't tell anybody that there's not actually an engine in there. It's a secret. Shh. After that I install the transmission cover. You might say, boy Herbert, that looks difficult to install, but you would be wrong. It is quite the opposite, that is to say it's easy. Then using possibly a bit too much glue, I install this strip of bolts that runs across the top of the transmission casing. Simple enough. I follow that with this bracket thing. There are some little notches which make the mounting of this quite easy. I have no idea what it's for, maybe it's for attaching a long sword to the front, like a bayonet, except for a tank. Cool. Now it's time to install the bogies. These are generally thought to greatly improve the mobility of the vehicle. There are guide pins to help with this installation, and you might have noticed that there are single mounting holes for the front bogies, and two each for the rear pairs. This is one of the reasons for paying good attention while assembling those bogies. The differences between them are subtle, but they are there. And you'll find that guide pin on the top of the front return roller useless if it's in a different position. Once all the bogies are in place, I add the idler wheel. These are very simple to install. Next I install the drive sprocket. The poly cap does make this a slightly tight fit, apply pressure and some twisting, and it's on in short order. There's no need for glue here, and you will want this to be able to move so that it links in with the tracks, which come next. Starting with the upper run is the most obvious thing to do, because of the keying, which makes it super easy to get the tracks in the right place. I really like this. Once the top run of tracks is in place and glued, I line it up with the drive sprocket and add the single links there. This is a little bit fiddly, but not too bad. 
Of course, consult the instructions to see how many links there should be here. Then comes the longer set of tracks that go at the front. All of this is pretty basic and I'm sure you can figure out how it works, and if you are building this kit yourself you've probably got the instructions, which are pretty clear around how the tracks go on. In pretty short order I had the left set of tracks on. I didn't film the installation of the right hand tracks, but you'll see proof later that I did in fact install them, because they're there. Anyway, I move on and assemble some nice racks. Nice ammo racks, that is. These racks are pretty simple to put together, and you should make two of them. They can then be glued into either side of the hull here. There are some bits of keying to help with this, and while I did have a bit of trouble working my brain around it initially, probably because of the way I was holding the parts, I did manage to get them glued in the correct way. These should be quite visible through the open top of the turret. Now it's time for drilling. Not just this one hole here at the front of the hull, but a whole bunch of them, predominantly at the rear of the hull. As you can see there is quite a few, and they'll mostly be for mounting tools. Before we do anything with those however, I mount the hinge parts for the driver and I guess co-driver. Since there's no hull machine gun I don't suppose you could really call him a hull gunner. These are pretty simple to get into place, though do be sure to use the correct parts, obviously. If you don't, you'll encounter issues when installing the hatches. I then work on the upper hull rear part. A handful of tools need to be installed here, which is pretty simple. It's just a matter of putting the right part into the correct mounting holes. The fire extinguishers here were a little bit more fiddly to get into place, but obviously not impossible. Otherwise they wouldn't be on, would they? I follow that with some lift rings. Nothing too tricky about getting these on either. Then some rear lamps. Butt lamps if you want to use the technical term. The small size of these does make them a bit fiddly to install, but the recesses they should be mounted into kind of cancels that out a bit, which is nice. I then glue that onto the rear of the upper hull part. The guide pins make this rather easy. There is a bit of a gap at the corners, which I'm pretty sure shouldn't be there, but that should be a pretty easy fix. Next comes the travel lock for the gun, which goes into this slot at the rear of the hull. This is meant to be installed with a slight rearward lean. Also, as you may be able to see here, I've installed brush guards on the butt lamps. I didn't video that, so I guess deal with it. Back to the front of the hull, I installed a headlamp. There's a mounting for this at the front left, and even though the part is a bit small, it's not that hard to put on relatively nice and straight. Then I add some more racks to the hull, which are also nice racks. Ha ha ha! Boobs. These are racks for the grousers, and there's one of these for either side of the hull. These parts are identical for either side, though I would kind of like to be able to put the grousers on individually, but this is fine. Back to the front of the hull again, it's time for some more lifty rings. These are just as easy to install as on the rear, and also, like the rear, there are two of these, one for each side, obviously. Next, I add the skirty bits along the lower side of the hull. These fit okay, but there's a fair bit of gappage here too, which will need to be filled in later. I'm sure I can manage that without catching fire. I follow this with some hatches. Hatches for the driver and co-driver specifically. Also with an open turret, nobody else gets hatches, so I don't know who else they might be for. Anyway, this is pretty simple as you might imagine. I add a little bit of extra glue to the inside for to make good strong bond. I then add glue to these little bolty things on the front of the hull. These will function as mounting points for the extra armour plate, which goes on nice and easy. I don't know if all Achilles had this plate, but I think it looks good so I've put it on. I follow that with what seems to be an antenna base. I think I remarked on stream that it kind of hurt to push this in because it's pointy. To rectify that I could have made the mounting hole slightly bigger, because it is one that I drilled, but it worked out fine anyway. What's model building without a little bit of stabbing anyway? There's another slightly less pointy antenna that goes into the recess on the hull's right side, like so. Very antenna. Now seems like as good a time as any to install tools on the engine deck. I'm sure I don't need to go into detail for every little piece, so I'm just going to zip through it and shave a couple of seconds off the video's length. All of the tools were pretty easy to install, and just like that, the tools are on and it's time to glue the upper hull to the lower hull. This is, unsurprisingly, done by adding glue to all of the contact points and applying a bit of pressure. 
and not at all like magic, it's together. If you look at it from below you can see right up into the hull, which I don't think is super realistic, but this isn't a normal viewing angle, so is it really a problem? I don't think so. There are still some optional things to add to the hull, like these spare track links which go here. There's nothing to guide these, so to try and get them centred I looked at the nubs on the armour plate and used those as a guide. These are nice because they hide that little bit of mess I made with the glue earlier, which I probably didn't mention anyway. And then spare wheels. There are mounts for these and I think it looks better to have the wheels instead of those mounting knobs. In my mind the spare wheels being here is kind of iconic for M10s. I mean they look fine without it but it really does say M10 tank destroyer to me. Of course if you want you could add a bunch of other stowage here and indeed all around the vehicle and I might do that myself but that's not really what this video is about. Now it's time to work on the turret. I start by gluing details to the insides of the turret. On the right side we have this set of boxes and what looks to be a roll of canvas which is probably the cover for the turret. Then a pair of Sten guns, or what I'm led to believe are Sten guns, I'm not much of a gunsman, but being a British vehicle Sten guns would make sense. There's also this nice rack for storing ammo conveniently close to the gun. And then this box goes across the top. I'm not totally sure what this is but it looks like stowage, probably for tea. Then into a notch in the turret ring I glue a seat. The left half of the turret is fairly similar. There's another rack for three shells, there's also two more Sten guns on a bit less of an angle, and another canvas roll, this time without the boxes. There's also a fire extinguisher, which is really handy if your vehicle happens to catch fire. You wouldn't expect that, but that is the case. All of these bits were slightly fiddly to get into place, but nothing too difficult. There's another two notches in the turret ring on this side and the one further forward is for this wheel, which I assume, I think correctly, is for turret rotation. It's pretty simple to install. I believe the M10 only had manual traverse for the turret, which at first sounds pretty awful, but when you think about its role it doesn't seem like such a big issue. Of course there is another seat here too, which is just as easy to install as on the other side of the turret. Next I assemble the gun breech parts. I glue this part which will hold control wheels onto the main part. Very descriptive terms I know. Remember the control wheels I mentioned? I hope so, it was only a few seconds ago. Anyway, they go into either side of the assembly like so. Then because I was having trouble figuring out how to assemble it on the gun breech assembly, I glue the two halves of the gun breech guard together and then this little bit goes into the rear. It's a bit fiddly to do, but I think it's probably better to do it this way and attach it to the breech part later. I set that aside while I put this thing together. This will be the pivot point of the main gun. Next I install the breech block. I don't think the gun would be at all effective without this. It goes into place nice and easy. The pivot point part previously put together goes onto the front of the breech assembly like so. There's a bit of D-shaped keying here and it's not really relevant at this point, but the instructions do seem to want it a particular way around, so I've done that. Then I attach the breech guard. It did take a little bit of fiddling, but I figured it out fairly quickly and I added glue to make sure that it would stay there. Nothing worse than a breech guard that keeps going missing. The gun mantlet needed some lift rings, and who am I to deny it? There are some little round guide parts into which these should be installed. There's nothing much to it, but I'm sure you'll agree the result does look good. I managed to not film it, but I did glue the small muzzle brake half onto the main gun. It's not a perfect fit, but it's pretty good. A little bit of sanding and you probably won't see the join line at all. Then I glue the two halves of the weight into place. If you don't do this the gun is going to look utterly ridiculous, but not in the fun way. I set that aside for a while as I glue the upper parts into the lower counterweight part, pretty much as simple as it looks. Add glue, plop the parts in, press, done. Now it's time to glue the two halves of the turret together. I add poly caps into the mounting holes for the main gun which slip right into place with no issue. Then it's a matter of putting the gun breech part into place and then the other side of the turret. There is keying at the front and rear to assist with this. And it is very simple. 
I add glue so that it will stay right where I want it, and then let it bond for a bit. But through the wondrous magic of video editing, we can move right on to installing the inner mantlet part. This is keyed, which makes it very easy to get into the correct position, which is what we want. I follow that with the forward bit of roof. This pretty much just dropped right into place. Then I slide the main gun in through the hole in the outer mantlet part, add glue to the part that will join the breech part, and then press it all together. That is of course pretty simple. The way this is done should allow the gun to elevate and depress. Of course you could add extra glue all around to make sure that it stays solidly in place, but that's up to the individual builder. Next, the duckbill counterweight is installed on the back of the turret, which is exactly where the weight of the gun needs countering. Makes sense, doesn't it? This part goes on very easily. Then there's a set of, I guess you would call them straps? Or maybe bars? Whatever they are, they join the counterweight to the turret. The first one was somehow very tricky for me to get into place, which is probably more because my brain doesn't work than an issue with the kit. The others did go into place quite a bit easier, including the last one which is more or less the same as the first one. Oh well, they're on now. Then I installed a mount for the machine gun. This should probably have been done a bit earlier, I just missed it in the instructions. Pay attention to the instructions, kiddos! Now that there's a mounting point for it, why not assemble the machine gun? This is a simple matter of gluing the ammo box to the side of the gun. It makes some sense to then install that gun. This is of course easy. You could have this facing any way you want really. I've chosen to put it this way, partly so that it isn't protruding out over the back of the turret, potentially being easy to break, and partly so that it's not in the way when I paint the interior of the turret. Then comes a pair of much thicker lift rings. I almost forgot about these, but I didn't, so take that. Another thing I almost forgot is another lift ring inside the turret, right between the ammo racks. This would certainly have been much easier to install before gluing the two halves of the turret together, but I couldn't exactly pull them apart. Well, I could, but why would I? What matters is I got it into place eventually. Then the turret locks into the top of the hull using a lock tab system, much like a lot of Tamiya's other turreted vehicles. And the M10 Achilles in 148th scale by Tamiya is completed. I think the result is pretty good. Of course there are a couple of bits and pieces that need to be filled, which in my experience is kind of uncommon for Tamiya's models, but it's not like it's going to be a huge amount of work. Clearly I haven't filled those bits in yet, but that's not what this video is about anyway. In my opinion, this model looks quite good, and I think it's going to look even better when I eventually get around to painting it. I think before doing that I might add some extra stowage. I feel like that would make it a bit more interesting. Obviously. I wouldn't go so far as to say the kit needs it, but it might be fun. We'll see though, I make no promises and I'm really just pondering out loud. Of course the M10 looks fine without any extras added to it, and the detail is already plentiful and quite good. Like I probably said earlier, I'm no M10 Achillesologist, so if there's some tiny incorrect detail, or even a large one, I haven't noticed it. It is obviously a Tamiya kit, so it's not really surprising that it's quite good. I really enjoy these Tamiya 148th scale kits, and I do have some more lined up, so keep an eye out for when I stream those builds. Actually keep an eye out for all of my streams. I stream the building of pretty much every model I make videos about nowadays, so if you would like to see that sort of thing, head on over to twitch.tv slash herbert underscore erpaderp, or follow the convenient link in the description. Give me a follow, and when I go live, drop by and say hi. Speaking of build, this kit was, as you might not be surprised to learn, quite enjoyable to build. It did take me a few streams to get done, though that does involve a fair bit of distraction. You could probably put this thing together in an afternoon or two, if you're more focused on building it than I was. It wasn't especially challenging, though there were a couple of moments I was a bit confused at how some parts were meant to be installed, like the ammo racks in the hull and the bars on the counterweight, but that's really more my brain not cooperating than an issue with the kit. Maybe a slight issue with the instructions? Obviously I got past it though, so maybe it's not a big deal. Something I rather liked about this kit that I don't really see very often is the keying for the tracks. 
I mean, I have built plenty of sets of link and length tracks that ended up fine with no keying, but quite often you do have to guess where the pieces of track should sit. That's not so bad, but it can mean that the tracks are a little bit out of place to start with, which can of course compound and then end up being quite a problem. So it's nice to avoid that with keying. There are obviously a lot of other things to like about this kit, but that kind of stood out for me. Anyway, what do you think of this Achilles kit? Have you built it yourself? If so, we would love to see pictures of it over on Discord. Either way, let me know what you think in the description below. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, become a patron and all of those things you do on the internet. And if you're feeling really helpful, maybe share this video with your friends and anybody you think might get something out of it. That would be awesome. Links to all of my things are in the description below, and as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, and thanks for watching. Farewell.